All right, here we go for round two for this week. I want to spend a little time talking about uh, Kunin and Levine's uh, article. This is probably my, um, my favorite uh, reading for what we have in these two weeks on reference interviews. And the reason for that is, is this is a rare occasion where you will find a writer who's uh, not merely giving you theory, not merely giving you practical advice, uh, but actually laying things out in a step-by-step -step kind of way. In fact, these two authors are specifically presenting a four-step checklist to be used in the reference interview. Although if we examine that checklist very closely, we, we can still see that there's um, a certain amount of ambiguity and uh, a certain uh, amount of... Um, creativity, individual, individuality uh, that it allows. And for the obvious reasons that no two, no two reference interactions are really identical. Nonetheless, uh, I think the steps that they give to the uh, reference process are indeed good ones and are probably likely to lead to more satisfactory uh, reference interactions. So let me share my screen here. And we'll get right into this. So talking about the reference interview as a checklist. And of course, we already, we already looked at an article that uh, treated the reference interview as analogous to psychoanalysis. Uh, this particular article um, doesn't make the exact comparison, but uh, attempts to, to put this more in terms of uh, medicine, particularly in checklists that can be used in surgical procedures, although uh, Kuhn and Levine do not uh, spend a great deal of time on that analogy and do not uh, overstrain it very much. They, they use some examples. Interestingly, instead of an example, instead of a concrete individual example from surgery, they use one from, uh, from a, an airplane flight where the engines went out as an example of how checklists can be useful in an emergency situation. Of course, hopefully most of the time, a reference interview is not an emergency situation, although they, they do, um, in a kind of darkly humorous way, give one possible example that a, a question about mercury might uh, lead to a quick call to a poison control center. But uh, again, that would, that would be atypical, not typical of the reference interview. But uh, they, do, they do point out some things that uh, can benefit from checklists. You can avoid errors by going down the list. You can avoid omitting important things, especially uh, if there is some amount of stress or nervousness, or if you're engaged in some kind of complicated operation. Uh, a checklist can help you avoid forgetting something important. Um, we can understand both why surgeons might be resistant to this uh, because uh, you know, surgery is not going to be exactly the same from one individual and to the next, but also why it could be potentially beneficial to ensure that uh, nothing has been forgotten in this complicated procedure. Um, personally, I, I saw similar things uh, again when I used to be an archaeologist. Uh, many of the projects I worked on were oil pipelines. And uh, I didn't have very much in the way of checklists myself, aside from some things I needed to, to make sure were packed when I went out to the field and so forth. But many of the people I worked with who were, say, driving heavy equipment uh, would have checklists that they had to go down through in the, mor in the morning to ensure uh, you know, the safety and, uh, and you know, good quality and good maintenance on their, their bulldozers and other similar uh, types of equipment. It also helps avoid stress, avoid panic. Again, using, use, they use the, um, the airplane as an example. When there's a well-tested, predetermined routine, uh, you, can, you can go through it calmly, through something that you've practiced, even when uh, the situation you're in may be high stress. Now, uh, because a reference interview will usually be a much lower, should be, hopefully will be, a, a much lower stress uh, event than say, you know, an airplane losing two engines or um, you know, a, uh, a, a dangerous medical procedure. 
the list that they give is, is reasonably uh, simple and short. But I like it because they do present it as a step-by-step -step process. It's, it's reasonably easy to memorize, or even, you know, you can have a card next to you on your desk just uh, reminding you of these things and making sure that you carry out each individual step. So just going down through these, talking about them a little bit. The first one, uh, again, I think is commonsensical, but also as we have seen from some of our other reason readings, it tends to get forgotten frequently. Perhaps this is because librarians tend to be somewhat introverted people or, or maybe uh, for other reasons, which is just simply be approachable. You look up, you smile, you talk to the person, you avoid that uh, silently turning to your computer and start typing when somebody uh, asks a question. You, you actually begin by being interactive. Again, as I've stressed over and over, and which you'll probably hear me saying throughout this term, good customer service is part of reference services. Being approachable, smiling, talking to the person, not immediately turning to your computer and typing when you're asking questions, all that stuff uh, you know, goes into that, uh, the importance of being approachable. Even me, where I'm often tucked into my office as a reference librarian, where the, the reference interviews typically happen here in my office, right where I'm sitting, in, as you see here, rather than, uh, rather than at a desk out in the library, just simply because of the nature of the way we do the work at this library. Someone comes through the door, uh, looking up and giving a greeting is, is how I, uh, I seek to always begin my interactions, to make it clear that I am approachable, and just the fact that this is an office, you know, you're not invading my space by walking in here. You're, you're welcome to come in. The next step is arguably uh, the most vague, and it goes back to what I have said before, that there's no super precise instructions you'll ever get about how to do a reference interview, because uh, doing it correctly is practical knowledge that comes more from experience than from anything else. I do think this list is good. I like it. But, uh, but also just kind of the vagueness of the second point sort of shows that um, it isn't really possible to, to reduce the entirety of the reference interview into a checklist. Listen and inquire with open-ended questions. I think that's, that's very good. And also the example they use again, is, is something that I have stressed. It's very easy to misunderstand uh, the reference question at first. Uh, they use examples, someone comes in and wants to know about Mercury. Well, do you mean the chemical? Do you mean the planet? Do you mean the Roman god? Um, probing questions will eventually get at that. What exactly kind of Mercury are we talking about? And what do we actually want to know about it? Uh, we'll come out to that and that will help pinpoint uh, where the interview can go. We had another example, I think, last week, one of our readings, uh, you know, mentioned an example where somebody went to the reference desk and wanted to know about cellulitis, which is a, a skin condition, and was sent to get a book off the shelf that was about diet and weight loss. Um, maybe that got cleared up or not. I don't, I don't think the uh, article they used as an example told us but we can see how that's, that's a, um, a failed reference interaction, at least at first failed. Some, some wasted steps were, got, were gone through at the very least. That could have been avoided if those kinds of probing open-ended questions were asked. If someone just says, I want to know about cellulitis, don't just you know, immediately look up a book and hand them a call number. Uh, what are you trying to learn? What is this for? Uh, you know, are we, do we want something from say a nursing perspective? Are we looking for, are we looking for diet and health books? And that can clarify, no, no, I, I want to know about uh, the skin condition, so forth and so on. So those kinds of things can be, can be cleared up, can be clarified uh, through that portion of the uh, reference interaction. And that right there probably will end up making up the bulk of the interaction. And then a third step again is, is complementary to that. Uh, clarify, make sure you're actually getting what is necessary. Not only that do we know, okay, we know we want mercury, the chemical, uh, but what is this question about? Why are we asking about it? What kind of information is, is actually being sought here? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, which is the difference between, say, finding a, a book on chemistry and, and calling a, 
um, calling the poison control center, which is which is the kind of dramatic example that they use as they're laying out this checklist. And the fourth point I think is probably the easiest one to forget, which is why I especially like it that they mention this here. Follow up, and that, that doesn't mean later on, they mean follow up immediately and find out, is this the information that the patron wanted? Um, giving them the information or, or finding resources for them and then being like, there you go, and maybe going back to what you're doing or leaving to do another task, something like that. <clears throat> might leave the patron feeling a little befuddled, uh, maybe a little cold and also, uh, you know, maybe reacting with, but this isn't what I wanted. So that follow-up, did, did, uh, did you get the information you're looking for? Is this what you wanted? Did this completely answer your question? Um, one of the examples they used, and they, they even mentioned there's an approved list of librarian responses, that being one of them. Um, following up with that, helps ensure that uh, the patron has actually got what is needed and will also probably leave them with a better impression of the reference interview overall. Because of course, as we also saw in some of our readings last week, not only do reference interviews have an abysmal success rate of 55%, but also patrons are more satisfied with the reference interview when they get the impression that the librarian was friendly and helpful than they do is simply from getting the correct information. So even, even if you goof all the rest of this, the first two points be approachable, or excuse me, the first point be approachable, and the fourth point follow up uh, are probably, um, you know, based on what we've seen elsewhere, going to be the most important points uh, to ensure that the patron is satisfied with the reference interview experience. We'll be more likely to ask questions in the future, to use the library in the future, to you know, basically have a positive attitude toward the library, which is what we want. Again, going back to uh, the whole thing about, about customer satisfaction. So do keep this in mind. Keep in mind you will have a, a reference interview assignment coming up in the future where you will be asked to find somebody who has some kind of, of research need. It can, be, it can be most anything and you'll be conducting a reference interview. I recommend probably reviewing this article again before you do that and uh, using this checklist. Obviously, the second and third points are somewhat uh, open-ended, maybe a little bit nebulous about how exactly you will approach those. But nonetheless, I strongly recommend uh, using these four steps on this list uh, to, to help you carry out that assignment. So we have one additional reading from the week that I want to talk about, and we'll go from there. Uh, thank you very much.